maybe before I will start describing the work on the translator itself, let us go back more than one year to the uh, to events. So I know that all of you know what happened in the February, the Russia's war on Ukraine, but then in March, the refugees started uh, uh, going to other countries, including Czech Republic. So I just found out that uh, during March there were more than 200,000 Ukrainian refugees uh, going to Czechia. And uh, especially in the beginning, it was quite crowded, like people didn't know what to do. There were also many, many volunteers wanting to help. But what I uh, saw from personal experience and also in covered by the news was that one of the biggest obstacles were language barriers. So, for example, in what's in the photo, that's a, a center for the refugees where they had to register and so on. And uh, there were not enough people who could speak uh, Russian or Ukrainian from the Czech volunteers. So uh, that was the situation. So for the first uh, week, we were just frustrated sitting watching the news. But actually on March the 1st, a colleague of mine, Indrik Libovitsky from Charles University, wrote an email to a group of us uh, researchers in machine translation and natural language processing, uh, asking whether we shouldn't build a Czech-Ukrainian translator and put it on Lindat, Lindat Clarion infrastructure, uh, with the motivation that it should be better if it's direct translation, and I will talk about this later. So in the end, there was a team with many volunteers, uh, mostly from the uh, Institute for Formal and Applied Linguistics, Charles University, but also outside. And in the end, I became the head of the team. And now I would like to uh, describe what does it mean, put it on Lindat. So this is the Lindat Clarion infrastructure, where we already had from 2018, a translator for several languages, mostly used for English and Czech. And it's so we had some experience with this, and thanks to the Clarin, we could easily, very quickly put it online for a new language. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And also, uh, we had experience with high quality translation, so namely for English to Czech. Uh, the translation in 2018 already in a shared task was evaluated as better than human. Um, uh, human translation. So I couldn't believe that. So actually we run another <laughs> evaluation study and here is the result. So we had uh, about 50 news articles uh, in English translated to Czech by a professional translation agency and then by our machine translation system called Qubit. And we then have blind evaluation where uh, evaluators, including professional translators, I didn't know which source is which, and uh, each sentence was uh, scored from 0 to 10, 10 being the best translation, and uh, when scoring for adequacy, so whether the meaning of the sentence is preserved, so these are the results, so uh, we can see that there is a range, some sentences are translated better, some worse, but on average, the blue violent plot shows that uh, the results for the machine translation was judged on average as better than the uh, red uh, human translation. And some more details, like in 34% of sentences, the human translation was scored as better, but in 56, the machine translation was scored as better, the rest was tied. And uh, this was for adequacy, preserving the meaning, but we also evaluated fluency, so whether the grammar and style is okay, and there definitely the humans were still much better than the machine. Uh, but anyway, we had some experience with this. Of course, this is a result of more than 10 years of research and uh, collecting resources and expertise and so on. By the way, I remember some of the faces here collaborating with the Portuguese and Bulgarian on previous system, which was not never a machine translation, but we also did some uh, Portuguese and Spanish, Basque and so on translations. And if you know to more details about this evaluation and how the translation engine works. There is a paper, but let us go back to the Ukrainian story. So 
already within two weeks, we prepared a prototype of the Ukrainian Czech translation in both directions. But one of the problems was that the interface, the front end was maybe too for academics. We had some advanced options, but it was not simple enough for plain public. So we organized a hackathon where volunteers came and within a weekend they developed a new front end. So this is the screenshot of the new front end. Well, similar to what you know from other big companies, but um, Mm, now only for Ukrainian and Czech, you can switch the direction. And, uh, but there are some nice features. So for example, there is a phonetic transcription. So if you translate from Ukrainian to Czech, um, this is uh, the Czech translation uh, transcribed in Cyrillic script. So it was some five minutes of work for us but we had a lot of feedback that this is a really useful feature because not all the Ukrainians could fluently read Latin script. So this helped them to pronounce it. Of course, then we on the mobile app, we also have the button to pronounce it uh, by the computer or mobile phone, but this maybe is helpful for learning. So for the timeline, after one month, we improved the quality of the models. We released the Android application where you can also use the voice translation, as you know, for, for, for example, from Google Translate. And um, now the, it seems that this could be the end of the story. So we have improved the models, but actually the work is ongoing still until today. And the biggest work or goal is to collect more training data and clean it. So for example, I this is one of the many steps uh, in the pipeline. I'm communicating with uh, Czech uh, national libraries and there are thousands of Ukrainian books and some of those have translation in Czech. So I said, okay, this could be a nice uh, parallel data, but we need to first digitalize it. And actually it's somehow digitalized. But when I look, what is, are the Ukrainian books digitalized alike? So they use OCR probably set up for Russian. So the Ukrainian specific letters were recognized, not recognized correctly. And each time there is a different error. So it's not easy to post processes. So actually now I'm collaborating with colleagues working on OCR and we need to run the OCR again. So it's a long-term goal. Okay, you could ask why we decided to develop our own machine translation. Uh, why not wait using the standard Microsoft Bing Translate or um, Google Translate? Uh, so we had some feedback that the quality of this for English and Ukrainian is very low. So we hope that the quality will improve over time. And yes, it improved within the year, but we hope that we can, our solution could be faster. And yes, uh, we were able to release it within two weeks. And also we had uh, contact with the humanitarian organization uh, and with the refugees. So we had some feedback, what are their needs? What is the most important for them? Uh, also, the, we use the direct translation, not via English. And uh, we, there was an option, uh, so opt into the users could uh, say that we can collect the data. So we built an anonymized test set, which we use for further evaluation. And we offer free API for non-commercial usage. So there were many mm, websites, for example, like this, Help Ukraine, where the volunteers could offer a help. I can give you a fridge or I can teach your children mathematics. Uh, and all these offers were translated automatically to Ukraine or to Czech, unless the users provided both versions. So another interesting use case, usage, which I didn't expect, uh, I was contacted, I think exactly a year ago by the police of the Czech Republic, that they would also like to use our uh, translator, which we in the end called Charles Translator, Charles University. And they are collecting testimonies on war crimes in Ukraine. Actually, I can show you, this is a screenshot of the main web and there is a screenshot of the uh, form for the testimonies. So the, mostly the refugees in Czech Republic can provide a testimony and first they can provide it online or go to a police station and they can choose one of the preferred languages. So they can uh, write the testimony in Czech, English, Ukrainian, Russian. 
but most of the officers cannot speak Russian or Ukrainian. They even cannot read the uh, Cyrillic, so they needed some translation. But of course, this data is very sensitive. They cannot use, uh, they, it cannot leave the house. So uh, it had to be installed on, in there, uh, in the police building. So on-premise installation. And also they needed also Russian. So I had to train a Russian Czech translation system, which was somehow difficult. We had, in our team, we had some Ukrainian colleagues and to uh, convince them that they should help us improving Russian Czech translation was somehow tricky, but in the end they understood that this is also a very important goal that uh, for reporting those crimes and hopefully um, uh, then prosecuting those crimes. So now I will have a block of uh, uh, where I will try to convince you that it's uh, useful to have also direct translation. So although all of you know that Google Translate can translate over 100 languages, mm -hmm. but most of them are via mm -hmm. IOT. So let's have this situation. Uh, the Ukrainian sentence Zaras Zayava Hotova. So the declaration or application is now ready and we need to translate it to Czech. So with the um, Charles translator, we will get nyní je prohlášení připraveno, which is a correct translation. And what happens if we use another translator, like Google Translate? So the sentence is translated first to English behind the scenes, and it will be get translated as application, which is kind of okay in English, but then the Czech translation is aplikace, which means only a computer app. So the translation is wrong and it could lead to many misleading uh, situations as you can imagine. And another example from now from Czech to Ukrainian. So we have the first two sentences in English are the same. I am ill and what about you? But in the first case, the Czech distinguishes morphologically gender and the formality of uh, you, uh, formal and informal. So the first is uh, feminine and formal, the second one masculine and informal, and the Ukraine works the same. So here it's clear that it's one-to-one -one translation, but in other translators, uh, the distinction gets lost in English. So uh, here, nemocna is feminine, but it's translated as chvory, which is masculine. So in this case, you could consider it a funny example, but you know, in some situations combined with other translation, standard translation errors, it can lead to serious misunderstandings. The consistency of the text, if this, it's translated sentence by sentence and each sentence, the gender changes, it can lead to misunderstandings. Also, you can notice the third sentence, uh, which medicine uh, you take is translated, the medicine the pills is translated as narcotics because of English drugs. <laughs> And just like other translators, like DeepL uh, included Ukrainian in September last year, but the errors are the same. Well, the third sentence is now translated correctly, but the first two, and I think there is no better way if it's piloted via English, it, there needs to be error in one or the second sentence. By the way, e-translation has the same problem. And somehow Microsoft Bank is more clever, perhaps it's just coincidence, but this uh, it could be both masculine and feminine. So now uh, let's go back to the timeline. So this was the April when we released the application uh, for the mobile phone. And these are the statistics of usage for each week. And the red line is the direction from Ukrainian to Czech. The blue line is from Czech to Ukrainian. And on the uh, this scale, Y scale, there is the thousands of translations per week. It's just till September, I haven't time to update it. So we can see that there was some peak for uh, the direction from Czech, which was mostly caused by using our API for translating some websites. So all the offers in the volunteer website were translated at once. Maybe also some people were just interested in how it works, yet luckily some media coverage. And on the end, we can also see that the usage of Ukrainian to Czech is still growing. 
also using the voice translation. So, and we had really some feedback that it's useful for the refugees to have this. And now about the test set and evaluation. So with the collected test set of real sentences from the real world, of course, pseudonymized so that there is no personal information. We provided to the WMT share task and there were 11 systems. And the, again, the evaluation was anonymous. The, they scored this time from zero to six, which one is better. And these are the results. So there were even some better systems than ours, but we also provided the training data for the participants so that it can be compared on the same ground. And now, for example, here, Adam Mickiewicz University. So we have a collaboration or we plan to have a collaboration and share the ideas and so on. Um, finally, uh, I would like to say that, uh, well, these are the addresses where you can try these uh translators uh the first one we have also english uh, and other languages there the second one is currently only for ukraine and czech and maybe a personal opinion of mine so uh, like i was talking about helping ukrainian refugees but my opinion is that not that we are helping ukraine but ukraine is helping the whole europe so Maybe this is best uh, illustrated by this photo from one of the streets of Prague. So thank you for attention. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question to Martin? Did you have to take any measures um, in view of a possible heightened risk of cyber attack on these online services or the apps? Yes, very good question. So we were, of course, afraid if it cannot be misused. And uh, in the end, I couldn't imagine or, or very strange ideas how the Ukraine to check translation could, for example, sell the Russian army for anything. They have many people who could speak, who could understand Russian. Well, not everyone. Uh, but uh, so I think from the, for the translation itself is safe. But we also, or our colleagues developed a uh, high quality Ukrainian um, ASR, automatic speech recognition. So we hope that we could improve the quality of voice recognition. Currently, our application uses Google uh, services for this. And uh, the problem there is that that could be misused. Uh, we had some like messages that uh, there are some parties Russian that, that try to misuse it for scanning, for example, the Ukrainian police uh, recordings, like massively. And it's not really easy, or I was not able to find out a way how to prevent such misuse, like limiting, for example, someone offered us limiting the uh, seconds per IP address. But actually, the attackers can easily change the IP addresses each minute. While we have some, uh, like some of our customers, or the users of our system, are like traveling through the humanitarian centers and talking with the refugees like the whole day, several hours a day. So if we, after one hour, we cut the service, that wouldn't serve good. So we still don't know how to solve this. <laughs> Yes, thanks a lot for your brilliant talk and congr congratulations. Um, I think your uh, example is uh, brilliant. Anyone who starts uh, listening about research infrastructures first sees uh, this slide where uh, research infrastructure ta takes care of the sort of Lego bricks then then researchers can take and build a house with. Huh? And your case is, I think, a very good illustration for that, where you successfully were able to take the Lego bricks from the research infrastructure and build the translator. I would like to hear, uh, especially to motivate the discussions for tomorrow, uh, for the GA when we are discussing the next strategy and what we need to take care of in the future. What, from your uh, concrete experience, you think uh, the research infrastructure should be doing better or in addition to what we're doing now, that uh, examples like this in uh, cases of natural or human-made uh, uh, crisis, you can more quickly develop aid for human to help them communicate? 
Uh, okay, thanks. So I have several ideas. Uh, so definitely I am grateful that uh, we had the infrastructure for providing the translation to users and, and it was in like working for two years. So already some errors were uh, fixed. Um, but what we are still missing is like a front end developer. <laughs> and there is only, I think one like or several, but one full time for all the Czech Lindat Clarin uh, services, parsers, taggers, and so on. And actually it seems that like developing such an interface uh, like this is very easy. That was my original idea. So it's one hour of work, one box, second box, but no, there is actually a lot of work if you need to make it really usable for different platforms and users and so on. And um, so that's one like having such, like it's not a research, it's just a implementation, but someone needs to pay for it. And uh, also like what would be really helpful. So we were lucky that there is the uh, YERKT demands Opus Corpus for many parallel corpora for many languages, including Ukrainian and including Czech. Uh, but there could be much bigger uh, sources. And uh, so, for example, I know that some libraries are also communicating with Clarion and they have some metadata, but actually getting parallel text of translated into Czech and Ukrainian, any books, like it could be English books, or it's not an easy task using the current uh, search facilities, even like when I asked the libraries, they were working the experts on it for one week. And after that, they gave me 20 books. Have you considered or are you already collaborating with other countries? I know, for example, that uh, Poland is also quite exemplary in taking up Ukrainian refugees. I mean, is it easy to incorporate um, or are you collaborating with them to incorporate also Polish Ukraine translations? I will just repeat that the winning system or a very good system, it's it's from Poland, uh, even for, oh. for uh, Czech Ukrainian. And uh, I yeah. have read a paper, but unfortunately so far, the, I think we still plan to collaborate more. I'm not sure about the Polish Ukrainian translation, mm -hmm. whether they are providing it, but actually the second uh, award was from uh, like, uh, well, also for uh, the, uh, Opus MT, uh, they are also providing translation between many languages uh, and uh, including Ukrainian. I think there is still space for okay. for future research. <laughs> <laughs> okay, of course. <laughs> no. yes. okay. Are there any similar initiatives in other countries that Claren is aware of? Uh, I think we, we had a lot of initiatives uh, uh, by national consortia and, and the Clarin office, uh -huh. um, and we are preparing a presentation on that during one event, um, and they were various and oriented at different target groups, some at the refugees uh, coming to, to various countries, some at researchers who stayed in Ukraine, some at um, educating the European audiences about what's going on. So uh, there are lots of initiatives like, like this. And then we also had another Stephen Crowell Award for the Finnish-Ukrainian uh, uh, translation system developed as well. Um, so yes, we're working on that a lot. Mm -hmm. and the, the collaboration is, is still going on. Just to, to add to the list, I think we recently got an inquiry from a Ukrainian researcher that was interested in setting up um, a knowledge center on Ukrainian. Um, it's still in the making, but there might be some more progress relatively soon. Okay. And of course, I think we need to mention Jörg Tiedemann's work, uh, which also got the Steven Krauer Award uh, on a similar initiative, but was unfortunately unable to join us here in Lisbon. So he's also offering uh, the translator. Yes, and we have Ukrainian in Parliament, uh, but it's also thanks to our uh, Czech colleagues that, that we're helping with that. Well, uh, yes, my, Crystal and then from Finland. Uh, Jörg Tiedemann's work was mentioned, but uh, one thing that uh, if uh, there is an opportunity for uh, the delegates here to influence the European Parliament to release its speech translations, the, the interpretation sessions, they are uh, extremely hard to get. 
and uh -huh. that would be useful for training speech to speech systems. So this is just an appeal that if you uh, are able to influence the process, then please uh, uh, do something. <laughs> But if, if there is something you want, it would be good to actually to write something short on paper and just send it to us all. I mean, that would be really useful. Then we might be able to reuse it or just forward it to someone else that is more in touch with the European Commission. 